Free public Wi-Fi available in every city and village all across Europe, provided for and managed by the government. Sounds great, doesn't it? Well, Freifunk Aachen has had a different experience, and today Gregor is going to share some of the problems they found and what we can do about it. Let's give him a warm welcome. Well, hello everybody. Uh, hello Chaos West people, hello random strangers from the Congress, hello people on the internet. Um, within the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to present you uh, some stuff about Wi-Fi for you, which is a really honorable goal to achieve, why it's broken by technical specifications, and why this introduction is no longer friendly compared to what we thought about it in May. So, uh, to come to the overview of the talk, I'm first going to present the idea behind Wi-Fi for you, um, the plan that the European Commission had was implementing Wi-Fi for you, why it actually matters, 13 ways all this went wrong, what has been done, what can be done, and the sources I have to back up my claims. Spoiler alert, there's a joke with the sources. Okay, so what's the idea? Uh, Europe, or the European Union, is one of the biggest political behemoths we have in this world, and they're doing long-term strategies. Uh, the Europe 2020 strategy is what Europe aims to achieve by 2020 from the viewpoint of 2010. They want to bring employment to a level of 75% of the people aged 20 to 64. They want to reach a research and development goal that is 3% of Euro's GDP that is supposed to be invested in R&D. They want a climate and energy change which greenhouse gas emissions cut to 20% lower than 1990. 20% of their energy is supposed to come from renewables and 20% is increased in energy efficiency. And they want to get the rates of early school leavers below 10% and at least 30% of the people between 30 and 34 are supposed to have completed higher education. Now this is pretty boring and you probably wonder yourselves why the fuck is he boring us with you a strategy? Well, poverty and social exclusion also plays a role, and at least 20 million fewer people are supposed to be in or at risk of poverty and social exclusion. And since we're living in the year 2018, uh, the solution to all those problems is at least partially supposed to be digital. The idea is to introduce something like a digital single market. Wi-Fi for you is part of this program. The digital single market is basically trying to implement the four freedoms that we know from the single market of the European Union, the free exchange of goods, of capital, of services, and of labor in a digital way. So far, the digital market is a strategy program that is running from 2015 to 2020. It has 14 legislative proposals which have heavily impacted our everyday lives. Um, in May 2016, everything went off to a good start and geo-blocking has been disabled. Most of you might be enjoying that. Uh, in 2016, EIDAS has been introduced, which is basically a standard for secure protocols between European Union member states. I'm not sure if you're into IT security, but if you are, I'm told the people like it. Um, something that most of us might like is that the European Union has abolished roaming charges by 2017. In March 2018, Wi-Fi for You was supposed to follow as a program which is supposed to provide Wi-Fi for You networks will be free of charge, free of advertising, and free of personal data use. That was amazing. Yeah, and then somehow, somewhere, something went terribly wrong. Before that, at the last victory, we got the GDPR, which some might find annoying, but it is basically standardizing the use of personal data in the digital market space of the European Union. And, yeah. Then started September, and the Copyright Directive came. Some people might have heard the names link tags and censorship machines. If you want more information about that, you could contact the office of Julia Rida, 
the only member of the European Parliament on a pirate party ticket. And I'm not sure if you noticed, early this December, we got the e-evidence proclamation. The e-evidence proclamation is the new set of rules that is going to allow uh, law enforcement cross borders in the digital realm. What could go wrong? So, how did this start? This program was announced by Jean-Claude Juncker, the president of the European Commission, and he basically claimed that everyone benefiting from connectivity means that it should not matter where you live or how much you earn. So we propose today to equip every European village and every city with free wireless internet access around the main centers of public life by 2020. That sounds amazing. People like Freifunk love the idea. There was even some icing on the cake. Wi Fi for You founded networks will be free of charge, free of advertising, and free of personal data use. Um, at this point, some people actually discussed to ask the guy to become an honorary member of the Freifunk movement just because we liked it so much. And because, well, we're little digital hippies and money is far and few between, this guy has other means. He decided that he wanted to implement this as a European Union wide standard. Well, how does the European Union do that? They can either use a carrot or a stick. Uh, since not all people are rabbits and sticks are kind of forbidden in the European Union, you don't need people to do things, um, they usually use the next best thing, which is money. Well, mm, how, how, how can you use money to do that? You decide that you want to spend 120 million on it because you're the European Union and you have a ton of money. You decide that you want to have 8,000 municipalities that are supposed to install Wi-Fi for you and you decide that you're going to give every municipality that is going to do Wi-Fi for you WLAN 15,000 euros. You decide that you will spend this money in five calls and you will start the first call on May 2018. This is not intended to finance the entire installation and the extra money for keeping, it's just extra money for keeping the Wi-Fi for you standard. Wi-Fi for you founded networks actually will be free of charge, free of advertising and free of personal data use. So somehow you might want to compensate the poor towns and cities for the monetary losses they are suffering. Well, and if you look at the legislation that was given out, they also identified something that was, at least to people in the Freifunk community, a huge surprise and made them very happy. Um, they identified secu uh, security and data protection risks, and within the legal wording it said that the scheme will ensure full protection of personal data and sufficient level of authentication to ensure user friendliness, uh, of the connection at the access point level. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with IT security of mobile devices, but reading that made us very happy because it meant that they had understood a problem that we are not able to address in Freifunk yet, which means that the network has to authenticate itself to the user. So we thought, yay, network authentication, because one or two of you might remember Black Hat conference or other things where, for example, um, ISM eye catchers have been installed Wi-Fi based. Someone set up a honeypot and got all your personal information from your, uh, from your pin. That's not the best thing you want to have happened. So we were very positive. Um, we thought that this really mattered because your standards have normative effects, as you could see by the other programs. Today we pay with euros. The GDPR spawned data protection laws in China, Brazil, and California. Uh, actually, the Deutsche Telekom is using EU regulation to fight the so-called Vorratsdatenspeicherung we have learned to love and hate in Germany. And uh, this is just the beginning of the Wi-Fi for You project, because when the project runs successfully, the European Union usually keeps running it, and 120 million euros are not that much by European Union standards. Yeah. And now we come to 13 ways where it went wrong. 
Security and data protection risk. They had that in there. Everybody was happy. They put out a press release that said that everything is going to be fine. And then they announced that they're going to have the first call on the 15th of May. They're going to hand out 1,000 vouchers. They're going to spend roughly 50 million euros. That's not too much of my, um, money for the European Union. It's basically a prototype thing for running the program. Yeah, and then things went haywire. Uh, on the 25th of April 2018, the technical specs that were supposed to be installed uh, were given out for the first time. Within those technical specs, partially, uh, it was mentioned that from 2019 onwards, there's supposed to be a common authentication platform for every Wi-Fi for you hotspot. I'm not entirely sure who of you is creeped out yet, but let's start why and where this is a really bad idea. First of all, there's this GDPR thing. It says that we're not allowed to gather data that we don't need. Um, there's no need for any kind of authentication to use a simple wireless access. iPhone is proving this on a daily basis. And uh, if you want to come around with there's authentication needed for e-government services, you can do that as you do with every web shop. You authenticate yourself if you want to do something, otherwise there's no need to. Fiscal responsibility is also a question, even if you're the European Union. Running a centralized authentication server for a population of 450 million euro people in inner cities is going to burn your radio servers to the ground. With Freifunk Aachen and Freifunk Münsterland, who have been articulating this critique of the program, we have up to 9,000 or 15,000 daily users, and we are far and few between with our hotspots. Uh, setting up that kind of infrastructure is going to cost a ton of money. You could even ask if those are some kind of hidden subsidies to larger firms within the European Union. Due to the fact that there are only a few companies which can actually handle those massive server loads. Uh, especially since they are designated national authentication services. The next thing that basically jumps in your face is what you would usually call a matter of national security or union security since we are talking about the entire European Union. I'm not entirely sure how comfortable you feel about the fact that this would imply that there's somewhere a data trove sitting around for someone to break it open and basically get the movement data of every European Union citizen of the nation he just tracked. That's just spooky. And those are not the bad parts. They're still coming. It's getting better. Oh, and from an IT perspective, you have a single point of failure. I'm not entirely sure why you would want to do that to yourself, but people also like to shoot themselves in the knee. So those are five of the 13 promise ways this went wrong. Um, on the 13th of April 2018, uh, the technical specifications part two are released, and they mention the implementation of a captive portal. Uh, captive portals are things that we all have come across to love and hate about wireless access. Um, those inhibit innovation because all kinds of IoT devices are basically blocked by captive portals. And if we want a agenda to lead Europe in the 21st century and we build up a digital infrastructure that's blocking IoT devices, that might not be the way to go. Uh, also, there's the question of digital inclusion. I'm not sure if you ever tried to use a captive portal when you broke one of your hands or you had the pleasure of assisting one of your grandparents working through a captive portal where you don't know where you have to click and you have to make things bigger to actually hit the button. It's not really what we would call accessibility. I would like to remember you to the last point where it came to the fact that the Europe 2020 agenda actually aims for social ex inclusion and not social exclusion. Yeah, and also you kick a ton of legacy devices. I'm probably sure this is not a problem amongst the chaos people here, 
but quite a few people have more than five-year-old smartphones who still can't handle captive portals. And there's an IT security problem. Anyone ever heard of DNSSEC? Please show your hand. Yeah. That doesn't really work well with captive portals. So those are eight ways this thing went wrong. What's next? Um, the innovation inhibition of IoT devices is not going to be fixed by VPA3 because most IoT devices are not going to have the processing power to generate the random numbers that you actually need to lock in with VPA3. So this is something that might otherwise come up in the Q&As. Yeah, um, then they talk about an embedded snippet for a European Commission for monitoring actual functioning of the Wi-Fi for you network. This means that with your mobile device, you have to actually allow the access point to run a little bit of JavaScript that actually allows him to monitor your usage. How could that go wrong? Well, it's basically a potential backdoor into the access points which are standing around, and it allows to gather the user data. Java is known for having security issues. And um, since you don't really have physical control of wireless access points which you set up within the public domain, implementing a software that is vulnerable by design is opening up the access points to all kinds of attacks. So those are nine ways this goes sideways. Four more to come. Um, the next thing is kind of fun, perhaps. It makes complete sense to actually label the SSID Wi-Fi for you. No one would disagree with that. But without any form of authentication and with this planned Java setup, you would basically democratize hacking because setting up a honeypot to gather metadata of users just walking by and seeing, oh, that's a Wi-Fi for you SSID and there's no authentication, so I'm just going to use it and I'm not going to even notice if I'm fooled is, well, just too easy. Well, those are 10. There's more to come. Um, a week before the first call should have gone live, they also added the specification that um, the setup access points had to comply with Hotspot 2.0. This is a proprietary standard. And it's not really fun because, first of all, Hotspot 2.0 actually allows you to access your ZIM ID. And I really don't see any reason why a wireless hotspot driven in a public space should know my ZIM ID. I'm not entirely sure about you, but there's no reason for that. OK, Hotspot 2.0 actually helps you to get around captive portals and makes this more comfortable to use the wireless if you have a captive portal in the first place. You don't need that. If you scrap the captive portal, you can scrap the Hotspot 2.0, and it's auto-connect. Edurome can auto-connect without anything like that. Yeah, and there is, again, the hidden subsidy stuff. This is a bit more subtle, and it's a more complicated point. I'll try to bring it home gently. Uh, Hotspot 2.0 allows for so-called connection roaming, which basically means that you can steer traffic between the connection um, connection types of your mobile device, between the wireless channel and the mobile channel and the Bluetooth and the NFC and the LTE and the G5 and all those. Well, <clears throat> I, I, I would dare to make a conjecture because Hotspot 2.0 is proprietary. You don't really know how this is going to be handled on our device. Um, mobile traffic is a dent more expensive than wireless traffic. So if you actually buy your cell phone from your mobile provider and you don't actually hack your cell phone yourself and set up an OS on it, like most of you might do, Hotspot 2.0 could actually use to pass traffic from the mobile data streams to wireless data streams. So a wireless um, network in that way might be seen as subsidized to mobile providers, especially in inner cities where generating good mobile coverage is, f is really, really expensive, and it's a really competitive market. 
Nothing easier to help the big mobile companies by just setting up a wireless network that basically takes out a bit of the heat, if you like that. So yeah, you basically would start to subsidize mobile service providers. What's next? There's an inclusion problem. Yay, another one. Uh, Hotspot 2.0 allows to circumvent the captive portal, as mentioned earlier. Uh, State-of-the-art smartphones actually are compatible to Hotspot 2.0. So what you basically get is that poor people get captive portals on their legacy devices, and rich people, well, they got auto-connect to Wi-Fi for you without even noticing it. I'm not entirely sure which one you prefer, but both aren't that nice. So we have GDPR compliance problems, we have fiscal responsibility problems, we have hidden subsidations, we have national security issues, we have inhibition of innovation, we have inclusion problems, and we have three kinds of IT security problems. That is 12 ones that went wrong. Well, <clears throat> number 13 is gonna be a killer, but it's gonna take us a moment to get there. What happened next? On the 15th of May 2018, the first call went live. And the people in charge obviously showed their technical skills. The homepage broke down. There were too many municipalities trying to apply for those wonderful vouchers. Sweet, sweet European Union money. Well, uh, on the 14th of June, there came out a press release that the call has been canceled. Also, we have been in touch with the people and they decided that they're gonna hold an open market consultation until the 5th of October. Six days after the open market consultation where basically European Union asks the market what are viable solutions, they decided that they're gonna stick with their original idea. And they announced a second call for the 7th to 9th of November where they handed out 2,800 vouchers because they had to keep up spending with the money because it's not too much time until 2020. And uh, they basically started to spend 42 million of taxpayers' money with those wonderful technical specifications attached. Uh, on the 7th of December, the winners of the call are announced. Hey, um, I call those guys winners because on the 7th of December something else also happened. Um, as far as I know, there's going to be a talk on this Congress, or I hope at least a discussion about it. The regulation on cross-border access to e-evidence was agreed upon by the Council of the European Union. This is where it gets really, really funny. Number 13 is gonna be a lucky number. Um, if you please dare with me for a minute. And we go to Civics 101. The bedrock of our societies is a separation of powers into the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branch. Those together form the state, and then there's those funny people who actually form the economy. Usually some kind of company actually has user data. So far in Germany and most other European states, if you want to access personal data of a citizen, the executive branch has to ask the judicial branch if they would please see why it's necessary to invite the privacy of that citizen. If the judicial branch then agrees, they actually tell the company that they have to hand over the information, and then the information is handed to the executive branch. That kind of makes sense. It's not happy, but it's nice that it's this way. Also, in Germany, we have strong laws governing what you can actually not get from other people. For example, by German law, the Alexa recording from your living room where you plot the murder of your aunt with your spouse is inadmissible in court. Well, <clears throat> number 13 is a bit more fun. It's trying to solve the issue that you have if you have an executive branch in state A that wants information from a company in state B. Since they're not in the same state, 
It would be hard to agree on the judicial branch that would be in charge, stuff had to be implemented, all this would be very hard. So what happens now is, according to e-evidence, um, that the executive branch is basically calling the company that has the data they want to have. Not bad so far. And then, given the current state of affairs, the company has to answer to the executive branch directly. Um, within six hours. Just to get this together, the European Union is rolling out a Wi-Fi program for public spaces which is aimed at small and medium enterprises to apply to generate Wi-Fi coverage in the public domain for every citizen walking around. It's set up in the way that we wouldn't even realize or recognize when we connect to the infrastructure seamlessly. And now, some police department somewhere in Europe is able to track its citizens due to the centralized authentication infrastructure, which basically tells them if their citizens are abroad, and can then call the local Wi-Fi for you uh, Wi-Fi for you provider and ask them for the movement of the citizen they are tracking abroad. I'm not entirely sure, but. It's either time to refresh the memories of the European Commission about what the GDPR is about, or remember that the first Congress was in 1984. At least me felt like that. Yeah, so this is what happened so far in the public domain, and everything of this is certified. How does it happen that little me is standing in front of you um, and proclaims to be someone who knows about all that? From Freifunk Aachen, we've been involved in the topic since 2017. Uh, actually, Wi-Fi for You is what dragged me into Freifunk, because I read about the program in summer of 2017, and I was looking for people who might know if this is a good idea. Um, in November 2017, we wrote the first email to the European Commission telling them that the then used idea of Eduroam for everybody, also using a centralized authentication infrastructure, is not a good idea. Uh, we changed some emails, we exchanged some phone calls, and they told us that they were very happy about our input and they would come back to us. We were ha happy about it, it's like, wow, this is, this is perfect. We just call them and tell them, like, this is a bad idea, and they're like, oh, thanks for the input, we're going to call you back. Well, they did. Early April 2018, so about six weeks before the call went online, they gave us technical specifications which they had under consideration. Um, I remember the three of us, I think Malte is here over there. Hey, Malte. Uh, and Yannick worked through the night to dig through those 20 pages of technical specifications that they were considering and came up with something like an opinion which basically was, please don't do that. Um, this led to a wonderful text, um, which is in German called Über die Unzweckmäßigkeit von Vorschaltseiten, which can be found on the homepage of Freifunk Aachen. Um, they still went ahead and started publishing the uh, technical specifications mentioned earlier. We then started to contact the members of the European Parliament that are basically responsible for Aachen. Um, and Julia Reda, because, well, she is responsible for the internet, right? Um, those actually decided to write to the European Commission and told them to please listen to what we're saying. And um, after the first call had been gone bust, uh, there was a vi visit to Brussels that was actually facilitated by the office of Julia Reda, where we talked to the head of the unit and he asked us to summarize all the problems we saw, and we did. We felt very happy because we think that, for a moment, thought, naivety, naive as we were, um, that we triggered the open market consultation. We even participated in the open market consultation and submitted material and input, and we were set to a three-hour tel telephone conference in the middle of the day. Well, 
all this didn't work, as you might remember. So what do you do if you're a little helpless person? You take to Twitter. For example, Jimmy Schulz, which is the head of the Commission for the Digital Agenda of the Bundestag, was tweeting about Wi-Fi for you and the fact that he was and thrilled about the program taking off. And we just mentioned that there might be tiny problems with the infrastructure. We might have used more clarifying language. Um, he actually jumped on it and said that he's going to ask around about it. Uh, he started a so-called schriftliche Anfrage, which is some fine form of parliamentary inquiry to the Bundesregierung, and asked them what they thought about the Wi-Fi for You program. The Bundesregierung happily answered, well, the European Union usually knows their shit. Um, yeah, or they don't. Uh, also, Anke Domscheid Berg, which perhaps is around, or at least visible at the Congress, on Twitter opened up to say that there is a meeting of the uh, Commission on the Digital Agenda, and if any of us had any questions to ask, we should tell her, so we did. And she also asked, the Committee of the Digital Agenda, which is quite funny because um, the GDPR officer of Germany was sitting in front of this committee. They had the question from Jimmy Chul they had had the question from Jimmy Chul's beforehand about Wi-Fi for you, and they still didn't know anything about the program, and they will get back to her. Well, we haven't heard back yet, but that's just two weeks ago, and there was Christmas. But what also happened, and that is basically the finalization of one and a half years of work, uh, on the 14th of December, Jimmy Schultz decided to write an open letter to Giovanni Buratelli, who is the European Data Protection Officer. And it's an open letter, so it's going to be fun to see what comes from that. Um, at this point, I think it's uh, fair to mention that I'm not a member of any political party in Germany, but I'm just happy if politicians actually answer if you write them angry emails. Um, yeah. Now, the big question is, what can be done? This is what has been done. Um, you could write your member of the European Parliament, and in Source 37, you can actually check out who is a European Parliament member who is responsible for you. This also goes to the people from the internet. Just check out and write them and ask them questions about Wi-Fi for you. All the sources are in the background of this presentation and it will be loaded up afterwards. You could check out if your town is a winner. And if it is, you might actually out yourself to your local politicians that you're a person who's capable of understanding the technical difficulties and tell them that they're about to force a 1984-esque observation infrastructure down their citizens' throats. They might actually be very happy because I'm quite sure that most small towns and cities cannot afford IT specialists to check for GDPR compliance of a European Union program. They usually would just assume it's going to work out well. You could write to the European Commission. They actually have a website where you can put in feedback to the program. So please, look at the technical specifications, check out all the other standards, see if you actually know a rower that can host 50 clients and only has 2 by 2 MIMO. And write them your opinion. Every letter makes them more happy. I guarantee you that. As a European Union, I'm not sure if anyone here knows Arne Semsrott. There is something like Frag den Staat, just on the European Union level, where you basically can ask the European Union if they would please be so kind to evaluate on their thinking. Um, since those are official inquiries, which those people have to answer, um, you're limited in the amount of questions which you're supposed to submit as a regular citizen. Um, I'm out of questions. So if any of you could take over, I'd be glad. Um, one could consider formulating a petition if anyone has free time and likes to write petitions within the next three days. We could do that. Or you could join the discussion how to actually build a desirable infrastructure and be constructive in the discussion and make a proposal to the European Commission what the technical specifications of Wi-Fi for you could actually look like. 
uh, tomorrow in the Open Infrastructure Orbit in Hall 2, uh, there is a workshop about Wi-Fi for, for, for you and how to fix it. Um, I'd be happy to see you join there, either when you're here or if you're in the internet, just drop me an email or tweet. And um, yeah, I think now it's time for questions. So for questions, we have two microphones. There's a microphone over there, and there's a microphone over there, and there's a microphone connected to the internet way back there. So I don't see a signal angel, and that means no questions on the internet. I have an empty microphone over there and an empty microphone over there. So while you are formulating your questions, Gregor, I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that tomorrow there's this session about coming up with what the optimal solution looks like. Do you already have an idea, ways that it could be improved? Uh, I would very much like to see the network authenticating itself to the user, following a decentralized power to the user standard. And I would be very happy if there wouldn't be a single point of, uh, of failure that is implemented with an authentication server. If you ever hear about any kind of major city where there is no mobile connection at the moment, that's usually a radio server that just died. Th those would be my, my two first hopes. And also, just don't take personal data if you don't need it. I, I really like the GDPR. All right, it seems that we have someone standing at this microphone over here. So please, loudly and close to the microphone. Thank you very much for the presentation. <laughs> Tomorrow we're going to look at how to fix the mess that's been created. How do we avoid a similar, uh, similar mess in the future? How do we get more tech knowledge into the EU institutions? So how do we fix this um, in advance? I, I guess um, be less naive. My, my, my mistake was that I wrote emails to those people and they answered nicely. And usually if I write email to people and they answer me nicely, um, I expect them that we have an understanding and if something takes longer, they're just a stress or something. Um, I think you shouldn't fear to just escalate the situation if stuff is not going your way. Just contact the head of unit if someone is not answering to you. And something I shied away from a lot because I'm used to work with people and trusting relationships is not using the press so far. Um, I think that might have helped a bit more if, especially after the first call, we would have made the effort to sit down and basically write a big blog post and publicize it over our channels. But we were still hoping for constructive dialogue. And I think that um, those, the people on the other side are pros. And perhaps you should use some more elbows. Yeah, that, that's basically it. All right, we have a question from the other microphone in this direction. Sure. I just wanted to say thanks for notifying uh, the office of Jimmy Schultz. I'm, I work there, and we would love to continue the cooperation and continue the work on a better Wi-Fi for EU directive there. Well, um, happy to serve. We didn't knew. Thank you. All right, we have a question now from the other microphone. Okay, hello. Uh, is, uh, can you elaborate more on the password, uh, Passport 2.0? Is it the same as EAP SIM protocol? Pardon me, I, I didn't understand the Could question. Could you speak uh, into the microphone, get real close? Okay, so uh, can you elaborate more on the Passport 2.0 protocol? Is it as the same as EAP SIM? Can you elaborate more on the, pa on the Passport 2.0 or the Passport 2.0. Yes, this. Um, I would love to. Um, I think Daniel is somewhere around here who gave a talk with me on the wireless community weekend about this issue. Um, the point is that I don't have much information because it's a proprietary standard. Um, we have a talk from the wireless community weekend um, in May where we looked at the Hotspot 2.0 standard and checked some technical specifications we knew it had to have from an open source handling of it. But um, the, the basic idea of Hotspot 2.0 is 
to to get your mobile device more usable. It's supposed to uh, get rid of the harassment of captive portals if you're actually authenticated. It's allowed, supposed to enable connection roaming. It's basically um, what you would call intelligent uh, interaction between your mobile device and an access point. And it's the first standard that is sought, as, as far as I understood it, the one of the first standards that is seeing your mobile device as a multi-channel op um, object. Whilst all the other IEEE standards usually are either 5G or, y uh, or VLAN or other mob or LTE standards, this is the first standard that tries to connect the different ways of communicating with the outside world. That, that's basically all I can tell you. OK, thank you. Sorry. From this it, microphone over here. I, I fully understand it's a, a little bit, bit closer, like, please. I fully understand it's a bit like David fighting Goliath. Um, can you give us some background on who the other participating, par participating parties in the consultation were? So who, who was the, the, the whole spectrum, the whole gamut of participants in that game? Um, I, I was about to come to that. I, I just going to jump ahead now. So um, basically, I'm one of the few extroverts within the Freifunk movement, so I won the gig of standing here. Um, the people who were driving this is uh, Freifunk Münsterland, which is Germany's biggest Freifunk community. They run about 4,500 access points, have 15,000 similar users, and are pretty big in what they're doing. Uh, Fuzzy Leapfrog actually helped with the presentation and getting it understandable. The city of Aachen is so nice to actually finance Freifunk Aachen and thus allows us to do all this useless political work because we don't have to run after funding. There is Yannick, who is also a Debian maintainer of Freifunk Aachen, who helped to basically dissect any kind of captive portals. Malte, who seems to still be sitting over there, helped a lot with uh, tearing apart all the wireless standards and the connection standards. Daniel, which I don't see at the moment, he is probably over at the Open Infrastructure Orbit, got a lot of in, uh, input into Hotspot 2.0. Um, Andreas Dorfer from Freifunk Flingern. Um, Daniel is from the um, is from the leader development team. Andreas Dorfer from Freifunk Flingern um, had some insights into the mobile world, and uh, Lars Langwies from Freifunk Euskirchen, I think, had some uh, input regarding some IT security issues. So it has been a broad and long discussion that has now amounted. Yeah. Was that helpful in answering your question? Or Great. All right. We have a question from the microphone to my right. Um, if I do want to bring Wi-Fi to my local community, would you say I need to stop using Wi-Fi for EU now, or is there any path to some useful form of that program? Um, one, one thing. Uh, to finish answering your question, also uh, Monique of Net needs to be mentioned because she's the one who forced me to be here. Um, so if I want to bring Wi-Fi to my local network, should yeah. I work within the framework of Wi-Fi for EU, or is there something else I should do? I would recommend to use something else at the moment. I would be very, very, very happy to find a municipality who actually is um, willing to make a press announcement that they are refusing to use Wi-Fi for EU after what they have learned about it especially given the centralized authentication infrastructure that's supposed to be implemented in 2019 in combination with the e-evidence problem. And at the moment, I would suggest finding the 15,000 euros somewhere else. Thanks. Because it's 15,000 euros, but if you set up wireless, 15,000 euros is basically the cost of three routers. OK. Let's give Gregor yeah. a huge round of applause. Thank you so much for coming out and telling us about Wi-Fi for you. Thank you. Oh, thanks for your time. <laughs>